Praise the Lord. Thank you so much. You're so precious. You, you, give, the Lord the, give the Lord the rest of it. He's the one that's worthy. Amen. Give him the rest of it. He really is worthy. Amen. Well, remain standing for just a moment. Pam and I got to fly home, get my vitamins. I'm a little bit of a diabetic. Got to take some insulin. Got some new shirts. Y'all understand, we came here with no clothes except what we had on and we went to a ball game. So I just said, there's no way I'm going to get up and just start preaching in the same outfit because then there'll be a fragrance that'll fill the room and it won't be. So I just decided to bring something new. Look at someone and say, you are in the right place tonight. You can be seated. Just before I minister, and I just love the fact that Pastor, pastor knows how important the word is, but you cannot have an atmosphere created without worship leaders that are anointed like this team. And you can't have a meeting without some fantastic volunteers that are dedicated and know that they are a part of the ministry of helps. Tomorrow night, I'm, I'm getting this stirring now in my spirit. I don't know why this happens, but sometimes it does. There's an arsenal that God has in the kingdom, a weapon arsenal. And I think... There's about six weapons, seven, that we use. Not, I'm not talking about the armor of God here in Ephesians 6. But there's one thing that has not been taught on in the, in the source of it being the main end-time weapon. And tomorrow, I feel like expose, exposing this to you. This will be one of the most helpful words of this entire revival. And then I want you to be prepared, if you have not received the Holy Spirit baptism, uh, to be prepared to pray tomorrow night. Now, I will tell you this. How many Baptists are here? All the Baptists stands up. I, my number one audience is Baptists. There's bound to be some Baptist folks here tonight. Come on, where's all my Baptist crowd? Look, a whole row here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We're over here, over here. All right, I knew you were here. The rest of you just don't want your pastor to know you're here. I know what you're doing, okay? I've been around you before, so. <laughs> but uh, thank you for being here. And uh, I just am so thrilled. It's, I, I, if, uh, um, if I say too much, I'll start crying, and then I, uh, you know, it'll, it'll congest me a little bit. I'm not going to do that, but uh, just to see what God is doing is very humbling. Jensen and I have talked about this, that when you know that God has put his hand on a place or a ministry or, or the people of an area, it is very, very humbling. You do not take it for, you don't take, take it for granted. You, you flow with it, and that's why I hope that you will, uh, we don't know how long we're going. We know we're going to go. We're not, we're having church tomorrow night. We're not having it on Saturday if you're here. We're not having it Saturday. We take a break. That gives the volunteers a break. We come back, and I'm, I didn't know I was doing both services Sunday morning. <laughs> he threw that one. He threw a curveball on me on that one. I want, I'm going to be honest with you. But I've got some things we're going to share. And then at 5 o'clock on Sunday night, I really believe I'm going to lay on you a heavy prophetic word that uh, I, don't, I don't even want to announce it because if God changes my mind, I have so many, I get, I get every day, how much, when do you think the rapture is going to happen? How much time do you think we got left? And I might just preach that Sunday night. How would you like that message? And uh, so we, we don't know. We don't know. We're just going to go with God. Let's go with God tonight. Say, put your hand up and say, I'm going to receive this. This is going to help me in Jesus name. I'm going to minister tonight on the subject of the mystery of the hour of testing. And I'm going to take for the text Revelation chapter 3 and verse 10. And as you know, the book of Revelation, those first uh, chapters, uh, you know, you got 1 and 2 and 3 right in there. It starts addressing seven churches that existed in John's day. And this was a message to one of the seven churches, but the verse itself deals with the end time or the time of the end. Here's what it says. <clears throat> because that you've kept the word of my patience, I will also keep you. Now notice, the, because you've kept the word. Everybody say the word. Because I've kept the word. Okay. Because you've kept the word of my patience, I will keep you. That means preserve you from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. This is not so much an individual thing. This is a global thing. And it will be called the hour of testing. What is an hour of testing? What, is, what does the, an hour mean? An hour of testing. Does it mean it's going to last for 60, 60 uh, seconds? No. It is a phrase that means a set time or an appointed time. In this reference, it would refer to the ultimate testing and the ultimate trial that would absolutely hit the earth at one time. 
Many years ago, I was studying the ministry of Jesus from St. John's Gospel, and I noticed something. I noticed in John chapter 2 and verse 4, when Mary asked him to turn the water to wine, he said, woman, mine hour is not yet come. And then in John 7 and 30, he was teaching, and they sought to take him. They were going to kill him. But it said this, they could not take him because his hour was not yet come. Notice the phrase, the hour keeps being mentioned. John chapter 8 and verse 20, he was in the temple ministering to people. And once again, the Pharisees said, we've got to stop this man. He's getting too popular. But it says they could not lay their hands on him because his hour was not yet come. Now, from his baptism, the beginning of his public ministry, to the moment that they arrested him in the Garden of Gethsemane is 42 months or three and a half years. That's how long he ministered. And then it says this in John 12. Three times it says that Christ is praying and says, Mine hour is come, for this is the hour I came to the world. Now, I want you to notice something in these verses. Very simple. That they, being the people, could not do anything with him. They could not stone him. They could Satan couldn't drown him in a boat. They could not push him off a cliff in Nazareth. Satan had no power to take his life. None at all, because it was not his hour. And when his hour came, listen to what he said. The prince of this world is coming, but he has nothing in me. And what he was saying is this. What you're about to see, the beating, the crucifixion, and my violent death, is not the devil doing it. This is all a part of the purpose of God. Amen? So give the Lord a hand for Jesus allowing his hour to come. So before we talk about the hour of testing, let me talk about blessings and testings. Because blessings and testings are linked to timing. I've often heard it said, and it's really true, everything is in the timing of the Lord. And there's nothing better than being in the perfect timing of God. I want to say something to some of you. Some of you have prayed, God, I'm a tither. I'd like for you to make me a millionaire. God can do that. Somebody needs to claim that. I mean, I, I just thought that it got, too, it got real too quiet right there. Somebody, okay, Jesus, that's all right with me, Lord. And uh, so some of you, though, want the blessings of God. But here's what you've got to understand. Can you handle the blessing? Do you know how many people sat in church and tithed and God prospered them? And they quit church because they had so much blessing. They, they spent their time on the lake, the golf course, the boat, and taking vacations. I know of a guy that was making 10 bucks an hour, went to 15 bucks an hour, went to 20 bucks an hour. He tied when he could only pay a dollar. And finally, after getting to 30 bucks an hour, he came to the pastor and said, Pastor, I want to tell you, I just am having a hard time paying tithes now on $30 an hour. He said, when, was, when I didn't make as much, it was easier, but it's harder now. The pastor said, raise your hands. He raised his hands. He said, God, take him back to $10. Oh, no, no, pastor. No, 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 no. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> so the question is this. Are you ready for the blessing? Can you take a blessing? So sometimes, let me say this. You might not be ready for the exposure you might not be ready for the popularity that you will have. You might, and I'm talking to people who have gifts of singing and music and acting. But you might not be ready when you think you are. Because the blessing could somehow become a distraction to you if you have not matured yourself before God and known how to remain humble before God. Peter was tested before he ever became the, the, the voice on the day of Pentecost and before he ever became the head of the Jerusalem branch of the church because Peter had two things. He had pride and he had a weakness. He opened his mouth at the wrong places at the wrong time. Uh, I'll not deny you. They'll deny you, but I'll not deny you. And what's the first thing he does? Uh, he denies the Lord. So he, but here's the thing. He learned his lesson. How many of you know the greatest lesson you'll ever learn is to learn your lesson the first time. Which is, don't repeat the same mistake that was a mistake. Your greatest lesson is to learn the first time. And so Simon Peter learned fast. That was one thing about him. He was a fast learner. And you will discover that when he died, according to church tradition, he wanted to be crucified upside down because he said he was not worthy to be crucified the way the Lord was crucified. So please note this. Blessings are in timing, 
And God told Malachi in Malachi chapter two and verse two, he was a prophet writing to Israel, rebuking them for wanting to build their houses and, and their lawn and buy their cattle. And they were ignoring the house of God. So the Lord said this, you better be careful because if you're not careful, quote, I will curse your blessings. And so what, was a, what should have been a blessing to you becomes a pain to you to keep up with because you did not move in the timing of God. Test and temptations. Let's talk about that for a minute because this is where we're going. A test, which is a trial or a temptation, are also linked to timing. Now notice this, that before Jesus began his public ministry, prior to him doing his first miracle, where was he? In the wilderness, being tested of the devil for 40 days, 40 nights. So before he got his ministry breakthrough, he went through 40 days of temptation. That's what the Bible says. Then again, before Peter preached on, at Pentecost in Luke 22, Jesus warned him, Peter, Satan has desired you that he might sift you as wheat, but I've prayed that your faith would not fail. So another, again, there was a testing before there was a blessing. All right. Paul was arresting Christians putting them in prison, and even consenting to having them stoned with legal papers from the high priest in Jerusalem before he was struck down on the road to Damascus and became an apostle. So everything is in timing. Now I'm going to share with you something. Why does God allow? And maybe you've never asked this, but you probably have if you've been Christian any length of time. Why, why does God allow you to go through a sudden test that sometimes is a fiery trial? Now, the Bible talks about the trial of your faith, much more precious than gold tried in the fire. But it also says that there are fiery darts of the wicked one. Now, a fiery dart is a mental thought. That's what that refers to. It's a metaphor that Paul used with Roman armor comparing mental thoughts that come against you. Now, there's two types of mental thoughts. Everybody ready? Say yes. yes. One that burns and one that don't. There's just two. One that does not burn is just a thought that comes in your mind that you're able to get over. It may, it may last a couple hours, but then, man, you change thought pattern and you move on, and next thing you know, you're not thinking about it. A fiery dart is something that burns in your mind. In other words, it could be a sexual temptation, and sometimes people can't get it out of their mind, the temptation out of their mind. Uh, men that have pornography problems, for example, will tell you that the problem with it is once the images are implanted in the brain the way the brain is made, it becomes like a fiery dart. You're always seeing the image over and over and over and over and over and over again. So there are fiery darts of the enemy that create trials in people's lives. Now, let's go on to this a little bit further because I want to show you the reason God allows you to experience a test. Here's four reasons God allows you to experience a test. Number one, testing you to see if you practice what you say you believe. You know, it's real good to say God is good all the time, all the time God is good. That's fine with you when you got money in the bank, four, wheel, four tires on your car that's still good, and the dog didn't get run over last night. But it's hard for you to say God is good all the time when somebody just lost their child in a death. Because their question is, why did God let this happen to me if God's good all the time? So sometimes you will preach to others. But, but God will say to you, okay, I'm going to see if you personally practice what you're teaching everybody else. Number two, the reason you get tested is to see if you will quit or you will keep going. When Peter was tested, he went out and wept bitterly to, him, to himself. And that's when Jesus was resurrected. What did he say? Go tell my disciples and Peter, because he wanted him to know I don't want you giving up and I don't want you quitting. I still have something for you to do. So God is going to test you to see, are you going to quit in the trial, give up? Or are you going to stand fast and do what Matthew 24 said, endure to the end? And the Greek word endure means to bear up under a weight. Number three, you are tested to see <laughs> if you really believe the word you're telling everybody else. For example, honey, don't worry about it. God's got this thing. So something happens to you and you're worrying. And the same person comes to you and says, well, you remember what you told me? 
You told me, baby, not to worry about it. God's got this thing. And then you say, oh, shut up. I don't want to hear that right now. Shut up. Go away. Go away. So in other words, you've been preaching to people a subject. You've been on a thought. I remember when Floyd Lahan, who knows Brother Lahan? Raise your hand. He came and preached here. When Floyd Lahan is one of my mentors, uh, was doing a series on healing, and he had great miracles happening. You know what happened? In Savannah, Georgia, he came down with cancer. It was like the enemy is mocking him, saying, wait a minute, you're teaching healing? Now, physician, heal yourself. Let's see if that healing word will work for you the way you have been preaching it to everybody else. You're, you're a marriage counselor. You're, you're, you're a counselor. You counsel marriage. You got a great marriage. And next thing you know, your marriage completely falls apart. What does the enemy do? Oh, a lot of counseling you can do. That was really good, wasn't it? You, you helped all these other people. What about you? You'll have it happen to your kids. I had a son that went for nine years on a drug alcohol addiction. He never saw a strength because we don't do it. And we never took drugs like this. But he got into a bondage, hooked on DMX cough medicine, hooked on alcohol from the time he was in his uh, late teens. Was it late teens, honey? Maybe, maybe mid teens. Yeah. And what happened is there was a guy at a convenience store that he would go buy the beer for underage kids. And you give him two beers and they'd give the kids the rest of them. The kids should, guy should have been arrested, but he wasn't. So one day, but bear with me while I tell this brief story. So one day, we get a, uh, was it a call from the police, honey, or a knock on the door? It was a call, wasn't it? And the police said, Mr. Stone, or Miss Stone, would you uh, please come out here? We have your son outside your house. I'm thinking, what's he doing outside the house? I thought he was upstairs asleep. And so we go outside, and there's Jonathan sitting there like this. He's got shorts on, a T-shirt on. I said, what's the deal? He said, well, here's what happened. Now, this, this is called a dumb gene, D-U-M-B, <laughs> dumb gene. And I tell you what, most of us, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to preach to the kids here, most of us had it at some point. Come on, mom and dad, admit it. Okay? So here's the dumb gene. He goes and gets beer. We didn't know he was doing it. He drinks a bunch of them, gets drunk, comes back into a gated community. A deer runs out in front of him, and he hits the deer, doesn't do a lot of damage to the car, and calls the police. <laughs> he's 17 years old. He's underage. So the police come out of the neighborhood and they come to the house. He's out there. I think I hear the deer coming in. Son, are you drunk yet? Let me see your license. He was 17. He's underage. And they said, Rev, we hate to tell you this, but we're going to either have to take him down and find him or lock him up for a night. And I, this is the hardest thing I ever did in my life, man. I don't say this happily. I said, you take him to jail and lock him up because I want him to know what will happen if he don't straighten up. And he said, I'll never talk to you again. F you. I shouldn't have said that from the pulpit, but I'm trying to tell you what happened. Blankety blank, you know, I'll never like you. You're, you're a dumb dad. I said, oh, shut up. You'll be back. And when you need gas in your car, you're going to come and ask me for money. I know what you're going to do. But don't give me that. I was upset. I was trying to do hard love. And you know what? We cried in the bed all night that night. But the enemy was saying this to me. He was saying, yeah, you've had thousands of kids filled with the Holy Ghost. You've had thousands of young people saved, and you're a preacher, and you can't even take care of your kids, and you're a preacher, and your kids disrespecting you? Ha, ha, ha. And when he was telling me off, I said, Shh, let me tell you something, son. Nothing you can do cannot make me love you. You can cuss me out and tell me you hate me, and I don't care, because I'm going to tell you something. I'm not looking, I'm not praying to the fool in you. I'm praying to the king in you. He said, there ain't a king in me. I said, that's what you think. But I'd like to tell you that he lives next door. He works for Karen Wheaton Ministry. I got three grandbabies that come over every day when we're home. Goody, goody, devil. The word did work after all. Hallelujah. And standing on the word work. Woo. But what he does, he'll send a mocking spirit to you to make you feel like that you've preached to others, but now that word's not going to work in your behalf. So God permits the test to see what your reaction is going to be. And I'm going to tell you number four, if I've ever learned one thing, most of your testing will occur prior to your biggest breakthrough. <laughs> oh, yeah. I need some black folks get me. I feel a black anointing coming on me. Hey. 
I'm trying to tell you it's a God's truth. I've been preaching for 46 years and I've seen the ups and I've seen the downs and I've seen the ins and I've seen the outs. I've seen the left, the right, the front, the back, but I got news for you. Every time the devil sent a test and I knew it came from hell, I knew if I could hold on a little bit longer, if I could keep my faith, if I did not give up, God Almighty was going to come down and give me a breakthrough. I've come by to tell somebody that if you're in a battle right now, you got to hang on a little bit longer because the breakthrough is on the way. Oh. This is the verse I wrote down. Listen to what it said about Jesus. Going to the cross, that's not fun. Getting whipped, that's not fun. But for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross and despised the shame and sat down on the right hand of the Father. What that means is all the time he's carrying that cross, he's thinking about the day that he's going to be exalted in heaven. Every time they're putting a nail in, he's thinking about, I'm going to be resurrected in three days. When he gave up the ghost and went to the bowels of the earth, kicked the bottom out of the grave, took the keys of death and hell from the devil, came out swinging the keys of death and hell, saying, Great where is your victory death where is your sting came out of that grave saying I'm he that was dead but I'm alive forevermore get your eyes on the prize take your eyes off the problem get your eyes on your breakthrough take your eyes off the trial and realize weeping may endure for the night my God I feel the Holy Ghost all over me but joy is going to come in the morning Oh, bless his name. It's so true. It's so true. Now, this part of the message, I guess you could call it the, the mystery of temptation. One of the Greek words for temptation is parodmos. I'll get it here in a minute. And it means adversity, being put to the test. And it comes from the Greek, the, it comes from the Greek word parazo, a very simple Greek word that means to test a metal by fire. Temptation is meant the word temptation. Now the word tempt is a different word. I mean, you know, there's temp, 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 tempted temptation. But let's take the word temptation. It's mentioned 14 times in the New Testament. Now, I got good news and bad news. Who wants it? Want the good news first? Good news first is there will come a time when you never have to put up with temptation again. Seriously. Here's the bad news. It's when you're dead. <laughs> That's the bad news. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I'm, gonna be, I'm a very upfront person. I try to be careful and use wisdom. But I thought when I got to be an old man, it, all, any kind of thought that shouldn't be in my mind would just stop. I figured the devil would look at me and say, don't mess with him, he's too old. <laughs> but I want to tell everybody here, and I think everybody here knows this, as long as you live in a flesh body, you can be subject to temptation. Well, the front row is giving me an amen. The rest of y'all are acting like, not me, not me, you know what I mean? I'm too old now, man. I never tempted. See no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. Come on. You're not a monkey. Some of you got that, some of you didn't. <laughs> All right, when you're younger, second, let me go through these quickly. Uh, there's, there's different tests at different age. When you're younger, 2 Timothy 2, 22 says, flee youthful lust. So David wasn't necessarily old with the Bathsheba situation, but that's an example of someone that dealt with his flesh. Then when you get married, you get clashes and cares. Clashes and cares. Oh, I just mean, one guy told me one time, he'd been married 20 years. He said, now me and my wife have never had an argument or a disagreement. I said, there's a lying devil if I ever saw one. <laughs> David was married to a woman, Saul's daughter. She mocked his worship. And that's why he separated from her physically and had no children through her. So that's an example of during marital time, clashes and cares. As you get older, Galatians 6 and 9, uh, there is something called the weariness of the flesh. Now, there's a verse in the Bible, and this is a great verse to preach on for everybody that's elderly, not old, but elderly. David said, I am weak this day, though anointed king. 
I'm weak this day. Though He had been chased by Saul so much. As he got older, he became physically weak, emotionally tired. We would call it drained or sometimes burnt out today. So as you get older, what you will have to deal with, you're going to have to deal with becoming weary, pushing yourself, taking care of your physical body, taking care of your mind, etc. Now, um, there are different types of testings. There is a, there's a temptation to quit. Do you know Moses and Elijah both asked God to kill them? They got so weary of dealing with people, they asked God to kill them. I'd be the opposite. I wouldn't say, God, kill me. I'd say, God, kill them. <laughs> Must be the Italian in me. I don't know. <clears throat> but you could be tempted to quit. You could be tempted to criticize. Remember, Israel complained. And what did God do? They went in circles for 40 years years. You'll find out that people who complain all the time feel like their life is stuck going in circles. And it is like Israel if you complain all the time. Number three, uh, you have uh, sexual temptation. You had Samson. Uh, you had uh, Samson and Delilah. By the way, it wasn't just Delilah. There were other women. You had David and Bathsheba. David, you know, David, seemed like every time a man died, David wanted to marry the woman. You, you know, the Abigail in the Bible, her husband was really bad and she had a bad husband, and when she, he died, you know, David said, come on with me, baby, you join the harem, you know? I mean, David, David, uh, he was, I love the man. I'm just saying I love the man, okay? I'm not, I have nothing bad to say about the man. But he, he got, I mean, he had like six, six or seven wives, and he got, had 14 kids with him, you know what I mean? So anyway, but Solomon, his son, had a real problem. The Bible says this, Solomon had 300 wives and 700 concubines. <clears throat> I wouldn't have put that in the Bible. It, it makes people think funky. You know what I'm saying? Hey, man, Solomon had 300. If I have two or three, what's the big deal? You know what I mean? It makes men, make, makes men think weird. <laughs> right, let, me just, let me just tell you something. Let me just tell you something. There is no way in the world you can take 300 wives shopping. Can you imagine the shopping disaster of Solomon's 300 wives? They walk in a shoe store. Woo! Look at those blue shoes. Baby, those are mine. Get your hands off of them. I saw them first. No, I saw them first. Can you imagine the fights that would break out taking 300 wives shopping? That's why he gets to the end of his life. You know what he says? All is vanity. All is vanity. Oh, my God. I had it all. It wasn't worth anything. Okay. So... <laughs> I will explain to you that a lot of the wives was him marrying the daughters of world leaders and tribal leaders to make treaties with them. So I'm not justifying the 300 wives. I'm just saying, yeah. Okay. All right. Now, my point is, I don't want to lose my point. My point is there's all, all sorts of testing, right? Now, I'm going to break this down to you from the Bible. There's three types of testing or temptation that everybody in this room will encounter. And here's the word I want to use. Common testing, seasonal testing, hour of testing. Common testing is 1 Corinthians 10, 13. There's no temptation taken you but such as common to man. But every, every man who is tempted, according to James, is drawn away by his own lust and enticed. But the Bible says God makes a way of escape that you might be able to bear it. So in other words, there is a common testing. For example, Everybody sooner or later loses their temper. Everybody sooner or later, la later says something they wish they hadn't said. Everybody sooner or later says some gossip and they think, I should have avoided that. So that's just common stuff. This is, this is what you deal with every day. Then there's seasonal. Luke chapter 4, 13. When Satan tempted Jesus on the Mount of Temptation for 40 days, it says Satan left him for a season. I looked up the Greek word season. It's, it meant till another opportune time. In other words, there would be another opportune moment when he would attack him. And I can tell you what it was. In the beginning of Jesus' ministry, Satan said, Are you the, if you're the son of God, if you're the son of God, if you're the son of God, three times, remember? And then Jesus quoted scriptures and Satan left. When you get to the end of Jesus' ministry, 42 months later, on the cross, if you're the son of God, save yourself. If you're the son of God, save us. Okay, so now you see the enemy coming back the way he did at the beginning of the ministry, questioning if Jesus is the son of God. That's what it meant. He leaves him for 
a season, okay? So I want to say this to somebody. The Holy Spirit just checked my spirit and said, I want you to say this to the people. There are some of you that had a bondage or a weakness of the flesh or a, 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 something you battled that was a sin, and you got victory over it. Maybe you went to a revival, prayer meeting, somebody prayed for you. Maybe you just got tired of it and it quit. It's really weird. You might go months, weeks, months, or years without ever having the feeling for the cocaine or the feeling for the pornography or anything. And one morning you will get up and it'll just be like, bam. And all that stuff is back on you. And you got to understand what's happening there. It, 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 it is not that you did not get delivered. <clears throat> Listen to me now. You were delivered and you are delivered. It is. And the tempter came. And that's, that's the verse in the Bible. And the tempter came. So what the enemy's doing to you is he's moving in another season. So he'll give you this. He'll give you, when I say the enemy, I'm talking about the forces of darkness, the work of the flesh. We're talking about the whole summary of the kingdom of, of the enemy. So what happens is you'll be fine for a long time. And then out of the absolute, I wish I was preaching to somebody here tonight. <laughs> 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 you, you know, you get on certain things, you're preaching, like, yeah, yeah, come on, shah, yeah. and you know, like, well, praise the Lord. How did, oh, Lord, did you? Okay, but I want you to understand people are here. They don't understand. If God freed me, then why am I having to deal with the same thing I don't want to deal with? Why am I going through the same thing that I've dealt with years ago, and now I'm having to redo it all over again? It's very simple. You live in a flesh body. You live in a body that's subject to temptation, and the enemy comes in seasons. But here's the good part. I'm going to tell you the good part. You can go into a season, and if you do the right thing, you can get over it, right? You can pass through that. And then that relief will start coming back into your spirit. So what you got to do is you got to understand some things are common, some things are seasonal, but the one that is the, is the toughest, <clears throat> and this is real important, is the hour of testing. And that's the one I was wanting to talk about for just a moment. What is the hour of testing? The hour of testing, <coughs> excuse me, is exactly what Job went through in chapter one and chapter two. The man is the greatest man in the East, thousands of sheep, thousands of camels, thousands of donkeys, 10 children. Every one of them had a house of their own. Next thing you know, the enemy says, I'm gonna, this is Job's hour. We're going to test Job and show you he only serves you because you blessed him. What happens? Man, bam, the Sabaeans came in, steal these animals. Oh, the Chaldeans come in and steal a bunch of animals. Ooh, lightning strikes, kills all the sheep. Hey, like that, 7,000 sheep died with lightning striking them. Then a whirlwind comes out of nowhere and takes the house down where his 10 children are, and he loses 10 kids at one time. Now, if that's not enough, the next thing in chapter 2, that happens is Satan attacks his health and suddenly in later on in the book of Job you can read where his health is completely gone and there's skin worms on him and he's taking pottery and scratching himself with the itching that's going on that's all in the book of Job so here's a man now think about this for a moment this is the hour of testing what is the hour of testing the hour of testing is when the unexpected happens to you you did not see it coming you had no warning it was coming. You will even ask the Lord, why didn't you warn me? If you would have warned me, I could have done something about this. And I, oh, I'm going to go ahead and go there. Hallelujah, Jesus. But I have had, I've had women that would say this. I just wish God would have warned me about that man I married. Oh, Pam and Perry, I married the wrong man. Well, let me talk to you about God warning you. When your sister said he was a bum, you didn't listen. When your mama said, get away from him, you didn't listen. When your daddy said, baby, there's something wrong with that man, you didn't listen. When your girlfriend's at the table drinking Starbucks coffee and looked at you and said, if I was you, I'd get rid of him, you didn't listen. That was God trying to warn you through four different people, but you didn't listen. Because God doesn't always come up. Thus saith the Lord. <laughs> Bobo is not good for you. <laughs> I'll tell you something about the hour of testing too. How do you know when you're in it? Well, it's not just when a, you're in a car wreck and you told your car and maybe someone passes away that you love. It, you ready for this? Trouble in the hour of testing usually comes in threes. 
Let me tell you why the enemy does things in threes. Because Ecclesiastes says a threefold cord is not easily broken. And that's positive. If two or three can agree as touching anything, it'll be done. That's positive. You get three people together. It's not easy to break through the cord of unity. But it works that way with Satan. He's learned a threefold cord is not easily broken. See, most of you can handle one thing. But boy, when two things hit, oh my goodness, and when three things come. And look at, look at Job. Look at Job. Satan said three statements. God said three statements positive about Job. And Satan said three statements bad. And Satan brought three attacks on him. Uh, hello. Three attacks. And then three friends showed up complaining about him. Talk to me, somebody. Trouble comes in threes. And so when you have... Uh, something, a loss in your house, your, the mortgage of the house is going under, the bank won't refinance, you've lost your job, and you've lost some of your family, you are in an hour of testing. Now listen to what the Bible says. This is, this is well, the end is good news, but this doesn't sound too good when I say it. For I will keep you from the hour of testing that is coming upon the whole world. God is going to find out who is on his side. He's going to find out who are the true and the faithful. Because in the book of Revelation, it's the true and the faithful who return with him to rule on the earth. All right. Everybody still here shout yes. yes. In the New Testament, in the Hebrew, the word tempt means to test by an adventure. To try to, to assay, which means to, to put a metal through a fi fire to get the impurities out of it. Like gold has impurities if you find it. And you put it through the fire and it becomes pure gold. All right? But in the New Testament, there's two different words with two different connotations. This is really, this is a great study. So I'm going to slow it down. Can I slow it down just a little bit? Just a bit. Thank you, all three of you. I'm doing it for you. Thank you. <laughs> Pat yourself and say you're doing it for me. Okay, here we go. The word that deals with testing or temptation, one word is dokimazo in Greek. And in the ancient manuscripts, dokimazo referred to a doctor passing his exam in order to get his medical degree. So he, the, doc, the doc, dokimazo was an examination, written exam, oral exam, that he had to pass it and then he would get his medical degree. So dokimazo in Greek originally alluded to passing an examination. Now, have y'all ever noticed that when you really are in a trial, you pray and it doesn't seem that God is really quick to answer? Has anybody been there besides me? Come on, Lord. Come on, Lord. Just tell me something. Give me a prophecy. I'll prophesy over myself. Shalalamaha. You know, give me a prophecy. I got to know. You don't hear. And the Lord spoke to me one day. He said, remember this, that when you have a exam in college, the teacher doesn't talk. The teacher's quiet when the test is going on. So God often is quiet while the test is going on. And you, listen to this, this is so good. You pass your test based upon the knowledge you have required and maintained. So if you know the Lord says, I will never leave you nor forsake you even to the end, then when Dokimazo comes and there's a test, you don't freak out because you said, I can't feel nothing right now, but that's just now. <laughs> it's coming back. It's coming back. It's coming back. So, so uh, this is a test that is passed by the knowledge. This is why the Bible says that Satan should get advantage of us. We're not ignorant of his devices. We have knowledge. So the knowledge of the Lord shall cover the earth and the sea and the sky. And so knowledge is knowing the word, knowing in your situations what to say. What Jesus did every, I wish I had time to break this down. The three temptations that Satan brought to Jesus in Luke 4 were lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. And Jesus quoted three direct verses all found in the book of Deuteronomy and when he quoted one, Satan came back. He quoted a second one, Satan came back. He quoted a third one, Satan came back. And finally, let me tell you something. Satan figured out there's no use in hanging with him because all he's going to do is quote scripture. <laughs> and so you've, in, in your testing, when you go through a test, you can talk about the Bible. You can talk about we need to pray. You can talk about maybe I should fast. 
Quit talking and start doing because faith without action is dead. And always remember, always remember, now this is important, that in these types of tests, you cannot outthink Satan. You know why? Because he's a spirit. And being a spirit, he operates in the thought realm. So if you're going to outthink your enemy, it will never happen. If you just sit and you're in your car driving or you're at your office and you're just thinking, he will outthink you. But I'm going to tell you what you can do that he can't. You can outtalk him. <laughs> Seriously, Jesus said these verses with his mouth. You never said, Satan, I rebuke you. And the devil said, I'm not rebuking. Who do you think you are telling me to rebuke? You never hear a voice talking back to you, resisting and rebuking and using the scripture. Now, the second word, and I'm going to give you some nuggets here, is perazo. And the Greek, the Greek word perazo, and we're talking about a test, going through a test, going through uh, a, a, a temptation in this instance means to pierce something with the intent of searching it. This word perazo is found in the Greek New Testament 14 times. And when Satan tempted Christ, perazo. And Jesus was tempted of the devil, perazo, okay? And it searches, what this is, it is a test, oh my, to search to see if there is either good or bad in the vessel. It is also a search to determine if the vessel has a particular weakness. Now, let me ask you a question. Why would the enemy want to know if you have a particular weakness? Because every sports team knows, capitalize on their weakness. All military men know where is the enemy's weakness. Everything in life, even in business, where is their weakness? And I, and I know I'm not, I don't want to get carnal on this, but how can we build our business up? Where's their, what can we do that they're not doing? So in every area of life, there can be a weakness. So the enemy knows if he can pressure you, perazzo, put pressure on your vessel, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, but if he can put pressure on it, what he will do, he will pressure to discover the weakness. And I'm telling you, and this is just true, once he knows the weakness, that's where your battle starts. Thank you, all five of you that understand what I'm saying. If you understand what I'm saying so far, clap your hands. I got to get to the rest of this. In the Greek time, in the Roman time, perazzo was to take a vessel or an object before it went to market, market publicly to ensure that it had no flaws so that it would be able to do what it was created by the creator to do. A perazzo is actually a temptation before a breakthrough, a test before a breakthrough. Perazzo is used for pressure. And this is all in Greek studies from the New Testament. Perazzo is a word in the New Testament Greek. Now, again, it's it's temptation in King James to tempt or temptation, but it is connected to this to, for, to a pressure that a man or woman could fold up or break up under the pressure. So in other words, it's a pressure to try to get you to break from your normal life, your normal routine, your normal faith or whatever it may be in that situation. It is used with the test and temptations of Satan always. Uh, to exploit a person's weakness. Now listen to what I'm about to say. The word in Greek, dokimazo, is used of God allowing you to be tested to show you what's in you. Can I tell you something? You do not know if you have a temper till you lose it. You don't know you still got some old cussing in you till, hello, come on, help me, Jesus. Help me, Lord, help me, Lord. <laughs> right? I mean, you don't know, you know, well, I've got away from that, praise God. And then you all, you, pot, pot, come on, I know I got some pot smokers in the house. Come on, I can smell you when you walked in the door. You ain't hiding it. <laughs> but if you've ever had any kind of addiction in the old days and you liked it, you, you'll, you, you'll find out what you're really like when you get back with the pot smokers. Have a, have a, come on, have a doobie, baby. Doobie was the old word. <laughs> you can tell them, doobie brothers. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting carnal. Help me, Jesus. Doobie brothers here. But, uh, you know, no. But what I'm saying is, you really don't know till you have opportunity to be tempted. Right. Now, let me tell you something. Be careful. The Bible even teaches this, that you judge people who have fallen into a temptation because God says, if you judge them, 
I'll let the same pressure come to you and you'll, you'll know what they felt and why they failed. And I do not, I'm telling you, when I hear, when I hear that a preacher messed up or I hear a church member, I do not go. I, I never, ever, my wife knows me. I've stood with people. I had a preacher tell me he lost his whole church. He said, you're the only preacher that stood with me. I brought the biggest names in and supported them. But when I fell, not one of them called me, not one of them prayed for me. And I said, I'm not just a fair weather friend. I'm a covenant man. And if I got a covenant friendship with you, I'll watch your back. Come on, I'll beat a devil up on your behalf. I'll tell somebody, shut up, shut your mouth. I do not want to hear your gossip. I do not want to hear what you got to say. You ain't here to find nobody. And I've actually done that before to folks. I'm not just saying that to say it, okay? But the thing about it is, let's go back to this because I'm, I'm just about done, but I've got to get, get through this. So, Mm, help me, Jesus. So in other words, dokimazo is used of God to test you to just see what's in you so you can see, oh boy, I better deal with this. But perazo is always used, always used of Satan tempting you. So I hope you can remember what I said just a, uh, just a moment ago about the two words. So God's word is to prove you. And that, that word prove, I mean, can I give you these verses? I'm gonna go through these so fast, guys. Don't put them on the screen for time. Uh, to, prove, to prove five yoke of oxen, Luke 4, 19. Romans 12, 2. The renewing of the mind to prove the will of God. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. If, to prove if a person is in the faith. 1 Thessalonians 5, 21. All, all things to hold, fa hold fast that which is good. Uh, uh, study to be approved of God. Do you know all of those words are the word I just gave you in Greek and it means to prove something to see if it can do it. To prove something to see if it's there. So we got two things going on here, and I want to I uh, get these through to you. One is God allowing you, and I'm talking to some folks here right now. I know I'm talking to some folks right now because you're in a test. You're in an economic test. You're in a family test, and this is where you got to just chill out and, and understand the test is for God to, God, if, God's, if God's allowing you to go through a test, it's to show you what's in you that you can deal with yourself. Here's a verse for you. Let us cleanse ourselves from filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting wholeness in the sight of God. There's some things only God can deliver you from, but there's some things you can deliver yourself from. Right? Right? And I'm going to give you one illustration here real quick. I was in the state of Maryland preaching many years ago. I've never forgot this story. And the revival just kept going. And back in that day, we went every night. Jensen remembers back in the days we went every night. We didn't take a break and people come to church, you know, until the glory hit them. And so I think we were there four weeks, three weeks or four weeks. Anyway, this guy came early in the ride. He said, Brother Perry, I want you to pray for me. He said, I got a lust demon. I got a big lust demon. He was so sincere. And I said, what's well, son, what do you mean? I can't look at a girl without wanting to undress her with my mind. Brother Perry, I'm tired. I said, son, you know what? God don't want you to be that way. I said, look, I'm going to pray for you. And I laid hands on him and I said, Lord, whatever spirit's controlling his mind, break this thing in Jesus' name. And, and I just prayed, a, you know, a prayer asking God to renew his mind, break it so he, would, he could feel free. But I will come back next night. Brother, this is the first day in I'm talking years. They all, I work with all kinds of women. Nothing came in my mind. I said, well, that's great. And he did good for a week. And then he came back in the second week of the revival. He said, oh, Brother Perry, you ain't going to believe what happened. There's a little girl in a miniskirt had the prettiest legs you ever saw in your life. <laughs> I said, stop, son. Let me just ask you a question. Are you a married man or a single man? And I, he said, I'm single. But you do look at girls. Yeah. I said, that's good. That's good. That's good. Okay. Just don't, just, just don't want, just, 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 I'm just checking. Don't go the other way. Don't go the other way. And he laughed a little bit. I said, let me just say one thing. You're not married. You are single. It is normal for you to look at a pretty girl. I said, look, see that woman over there? I married that woman from Tuscaloosa, Alabama, because she was so pretty. I didn't want nobody else to get her. And that's the truth. Woo! She still is. But anyway, back then, I was like, I'm, you know, people thought I was speaking in tongues. I'm looking at her. Oh, 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 Jesus, Jesus, help me, Jesus. Keep my mind on you, Jesus. Really, that really did happen. I wasn't lusting, but I was praying with one eye open and one eye closed. Watch as well as pray. Watch as well as pray. There she is, right there. She'll glory to God. That really happened. I'm not, I'm not joking. That really happened. 
Okay, so I go to pray for the guy, and I just want to encourage him. Okay, it's normal for you to look at a pretty girl. You're going to marry one one day. But if the lust thing is there, that's a different story. And I went to pray. So help me. I went to pray that same prayer, and the Lord said, stop, get your hands off of him. I said, ooh. I said, just a minute. I said, I'm hearing from the Lord. He said, would you tell him he does not need deliverance? He needs discipline. <laughs> okay. And I said, son, you just need discipline. And I went through the process of saying, discipline involves this, this, and this. And you know, that boy told me later, that was the greatest word he said, because Satan was trying to beat me up because I had feelings for females. I said, you're single. Good gracious. You know, you're going to do that. But I said, just understand that level. So in a lot of the times in your life, when you're going through what the enemy is doing, it's not a matter of, oh, somebody lay hands on me, put enough. Look, I put enough oil on some people's head that they could be an oil well in the Middle East if I stuck them in the water. You know, psh, well, just oil coming up all over the place. And found out with a lot of them, it didn't, it didn't do a whole lot of good when I, when I threw all that oil on them, though. So here's what I want to do. I want to give you four things. The Bible says that Christ is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. And we have a high priest that understands what we're going through. This is what I want to get to you in this closing part of this. Christ is touched with the feeling of our infirmity. The word touched in Greek is sympaeo, which is the word sympathy. Now think about this. So when we have infirmity, now by the way, the word infirmity does not mean sickness. We use the word infirmity today in English in the Western culture to mean a sickness. It is a Greek word that means weakness, physical, moral, emotional, or spiritual. Here, here's the deal. Christ has sympathy toward our physical, mental, emotional weaknesses. Now, do you understand what that means? When I grew up, Jensen, when we grew up in the church, I'm telling you, that now these were great men. I, don't, I do not say nothing, anything about them. But I'm telling you, they preached holiness or hell so bad that if you even thought a bad word, you thought you were backslid. I mean, every revival, I, Jensen probably did the same thing. Every revival, I'm running to the altar. Oh, God, I'm running to the altar. And then when I read this verse years later, I realized Jesus has sympathy when I struggle. Y'all better hear this. This is the Bible. I'm preaching the Bible to you. He is touched, has sympathy for our weaknesses. So what does that mean? Can I tell you why? He understands him. Can I tell you why he understands him? The next verse says this. He was tempted in all points as me and you, yet without sin. You know why? He had discipline. Y'all get this in a minute. That's why he didn't sin, because he had, he had extreme discipline. He is able, and one of the translations says this way, he is able to aid those who are being tempted. Now, the Bible talks about God being long-suffering in the days of Noah. And the reason God is long-suffering toward your weakness and your problem so many times, and you deal with it, and you get victory, and you go back. I'm talking to somebody now. And deal with it, and you go back. The reason he's long-suffering is because, here's the verse, it's not willing that anyone perish. Do you all understand this? God does not want anybody in this room to die lost. And he'll be long-suffering. If you are sincere and you want help and you just keep trying and you keep pressing. We went to a church one time. I'll not name the church many years ago. And I'm just about done, I promise. But we went to a church many years ago. And this guy, I don't mean, I, and, and my Baptist folks might not understand how I'm saying this, but Pentecostal folks will understand. But he got, quote, unquote, saved every revival. You know, I mean, every revival, he come, oh, God. And during the revival, he'd serve God and then he'd, Quit for a year, and every year I'd go back. Well, there's so-and-so again. I guess he knows Perry's coming. 16 years of this. He'd come to church, get right, leave, get back on drugs. Come to church, it went 16 years. And I said to Pam, I said, let me just tell you something, Pam. There's enough word that boy's heard. One of these days, it will stick. And they told me a few years ago, he came to church, got right with God, and now is a man of God in the church because the word stuck with him. God was long suffering. See, God was long suffering because he knew he knew in his heart he didn't want to be that way. He knew in his heart, there's the difference. He knew in his heart he wasn't trying to be weird or freaky or just be what he was not. Listen, people who struggle, okay, and love God are not hypocrites. There's just there are just people who are struggling. Okay? Four things. How does God aid you? I'm, uh, give you aid, A-I-D. Not AIDS, aid, A-I-D. 
I thought I, I, I thought I added that S to there. I've got to make sure I didn't do that. Everybody, here, here's your word tonight. Here's your word for Thursday night. Number one, he will give you a season of relief. If you will follow the Lord and just trust him and use the word, you'll get, you'll get a relief. You'll get a season of relief. Number two, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, he will make a way of escape. Okay, can I tell you, sometimes, people, sometimes the Lord will get people out of your life. That might be your way of escape. Okay. Matthew 15, 19 through 20, he gives you a new mind and a new heart. And number four, he helps remove you out of that, like abusive relationships or bad friends. He will separate you. And the Bible says he aids those who cry out unto him. Okay? Now, one story, and I'm done. And I want you to get ready for the altar call because God's going to touch a lot of people in the next few minutes. Many years ago, I went to a revival to preach in Alabama and... Uh, I, knew the, I knew a couple, and I knew his dad, and I knew his dad's background was the number two drug dealer in the entire United States. Number two. I, and I'm talking $20 million at a time. We're talking big money. He was about to be the head guy over the whole East Coast. And this, his son was saved. His son's wife was saved. So one service, I look up, and there is this man who the son invited to church to hear me preach. And that, not, that morning, I preached a message, I'll never forget it, called, I don't want to be a Christian. And the church went. I said, nope, I don't want to be a Christian because of Christians. And I started talking about four excuses that sinners use. That there's too many hypocrites in the church. All the church is after is your money. And I went through actually five things, and he had said all five of them to his son. And the Lord told me, Jensen, that morning, he said, don't give an altar call. Don't ask anybody to come. Have them stand and pray. When he stood in the back, he heard the word, and he, he stood to pray, and a hand touched him on the shoulder, and he thought somebody was laying hands on him, and he literally went to hit him. He's broken. He broke guys, uh, guys' jaws in the bar. One punch. Put 100 bucks down and punched him and broke their jaw. And he went to hit, and there was nobody there. And he prayed one simple prayer, one, one simple prayer. And he called his son. He said, so-and-so, I... I prayed that prayer with Perry this morning, but I don't feel no different. He said, Dad, don't worry about that. If you prayed it, did you really mean it? He said, yeah, I did. He said, I, need, I don't want to go to hell. Man, I've, I've done bad things. I have done bad things. Some of them are real bad. I know some of them, but I'd never tell nobody. He said, but yeah. I'm, I'm. So that, watch this. That Friday, he just goes back to the bar like he normally did, right? And when he walked in, they all knew him. They knew that he gets an iced pitcher, a pitcher, you know, frozen, cold. Look, I never, I went to a bar, so I'm trying to describe this to you, okay? <laughs> so he got a pitcher with ice. He said, you want your regular? He called his name. Yeah, give me a regular. And he sat it on the bar. He took one sip, and he heard the voice of God say, you know what? You don't belong here no more. <laughs> Nobody said nothing. It was God. He said, I'll be back in a minute. And he went and washed his face. And he said, whoa, whoa. I heard a voice and I, I was raised around churches. That was God. He said, I'll, be, I'll see y'all later. He walked out and listened to me. And in his years and years, I, I'm talking about decades of serving God. He never went back one time. All he needed, all he needed was a word from the Lord. He was, hey, he was never tempted with it. He gave up the drug industry. He had $3 million of cash in the walls of his house and gave it all to poor people. Bought cars for people in need. Bought houses. Is that not amazing? Now, you tell me who can do that but the Lord. But here's my point. It wasn't a travailing prayer. It wasn't a fall on the floor. And that's nothing wrong with that. Hear me. It was just a simple prayer of faith. And he believed. And God did something in him. Now, everybody here, Man, I feel that. Look at this. You know when your hair starts standing on the end? And, oh, God, one time I, I had those bumps all over my arm. I said, that might be Braille, a word from God in Braille. Somebody come up here and read it, please, and see what the Lord. I had a young person come up and go, God said he's in the house. I said, that's the word. That's the word right there, right off my arm. I just felt that. I just felt that. Did anybody just feel the Holy Spirit just move in this place? Come on. Woo. Wow, Jesus. Now. I do this thing, and there's really nothing special about it because what it does, it, it has everybody move at one time. I just count to three and say, come on. But here's what I feel. 
in my spirit, I feel some of you are really struggling and you don't tell nobody. Your wife don't know, your husband don't know, your kids don't know because you're too embarrassed to talk about it. And it would be, let me just, can I say something to you? There are some things that's between you and God. And I'm serious. There's some things you just keep between you and God and you and God have to handle it. And that's how I feel tonight. I don't feel like this is get up and confess and tell them what kind of problem you got. God knows already. <laughs> so, it's so funny. We used to say, close your eyes and bow your head. And I thought one day, well, God's watching. So why are we doing that? You know, he, I mean, he knows what everybody's going through. Now, in the balcony, on the main floor, you're going to get free tonight. God is going to give you a relief. I'm telling you, a spiritual relief from the pressure you've been under. If you are in a heavy temptation, a heavy trial, you need some relief in your mind. On the count of three, and I'm not going to hold a mic down here. I'm not going to say, what do you need, brother? Why'd you come up here, sister? That's nobody's business but you and God. But I want to see the people that say, Perry, I heard this message. How many have a new understanding of some things you didn't have before? Raise your hands. I want to see. Did you get something out of it? Okay. But on the count of three, fill up the front. And if we have to do the aisles again, we'll do the same thing. Prayer team, come up here right now, please. All the prayer team. I want the prayer team up here first. And this is where it just gets. I love these altar services. I see so many of you here. And you're praying and you're worshiping and you're crying out to God. But remember this. He aids those who cry out to him. So don't just come just kind of, well, Jesus, I ask you to help me. I want you to really pour out your heart in a minute and ask the Lord for help. And if you're in a really fiery test, God said to tell you to pray for the ability to endure it to the end. I don't know if I can pray a test off of you. Only God can do that. But I tell you what we can do. We can ask God to give you strength to endure and you come out on the other side. I know we can do that. Count of three, count of three, up in the balcony, on the main floor. If you say, Perry, I needed this message. I'm under a test. I'm under some kind of a trial. This pressure that I feel in my life, I'm not sure what to do with this. You heard me preach. Now's the time to respond. One, get ready. Two, I want you to come up here. Get ready. Three, come out of your seat right now. Everybody is seated so you can get out. Praise God. Come on down here with the prayer team on. Come on down here with the prayer team. Bless his name. Oh, bless the name of the Lord. Oh, bless the name Some of you, some of you may not be able to get to a prayer team person. Come on up here because I'm going to pray over you. I'm going to pray over everybody, but I want to, I've just felt a check in my spirit to pray with you, to pray with you in Jesus name. God bless all of you that are over here. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming to let the Lord touch you and minister to you. We're, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Ma, ma, ma. God's going to help you tonight. I'm telling you, He is. Oh, God. Jesus, I feel your presence, Lord. Oh my God, folks, there's a great anointing here. Let's raise our hands if we're seated to the Lord in heaven, please. Let's just honor the Lord. Bible said, pray lifting up holy hands. I want you to raise your hands and I'm gonna start praying for you that are in the aisles. And after I pray for you, you talk to the Lord on your own. Gracious God in heaven, the the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Most High God. I'm grateful for the revelation of the Word. I'm grateful for the open ears that have heard this Word that has gone into the heart and the spirit of every person that's standing in the front of this building and to every person that's in these aisles right now. God, every person here is at a different level of perhaps a spiritual trial or a spiritual attack. Some are at a light level. Some are at a medium level. Some are at a heavy level. 
But God, I come to you because I know what your will is to help them and to help them have peace and help them to overcome. Father, for everybody that's in a trial and they're in a test, I'm asking you to give them endurance ability till the end. I'm asking you, God, that with the test, make a way of enduring or make a way of escaping in Jesus' name, whatever it might be. Holy God, I ask you in Jesus' name for those that have pressure on their mind and pressure in their spirit that they're having a hard time to get in, getting rid of that. I'm asking you to bring relief in the name of Jesus. Bring relief from the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus, the Son of the living God. Oh, everybody praying in the building. Everybody praying. Everybody praying in the Spirit if you can. Oh, Jesus. Right now, right now, right now. Now, everybody in the altar, raise your hands. Open up your voice. Lift to lift up your voice. Cry out to God for His help. Cry out to God. They're gonna they're gonna sing, but don't start singing with them. Let them sing to the Lord. Let them sing. You keep crying out to God. All you young people in the aisle over here, just begin to cry out to God. Close your eyes over here in the middle aisle, over on that far aisle. Close your eyes. Cry out to God. Come on, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. For oh God's sake, oh God, my God.
the Spirit of God's impressing me. We've not done this the whole meeting. To take your left hand and your right hand and just touch the shoulder, not the head, but the shoulder of the person beside you. And I want to start a chain of prayer all over this building. Let's do it right now. Start praying for each other right now. If you don't know what to pray, pray in the Spirit, but pray for deliverance and salvation and help. I want you to lift your voice twice as loud. Make it, make it effectual. Make it fervent. Pray for each other. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh. God, through this chain of prayer, break yokes. Through this chain of prayer, bring deliverance. Through this chain of prayer, do something great. Through this chain of prayer, Heavenly Father, let peace come. I call peace into your mind. You've been tormented by a spirit. You've been tormented where, you, where it's been on your mind and you don't know what to do about it. I call it off in Jesus' name. I command that, that power of that spirit to go loose in the name of Jesus. For your heart to be free and your mind to be free. Oh God, that desire, that, that, that desire to return to something that they were free from. God, that desire, take it out, take it out in the name of Jesus. Any, any desire for the, for the drugs that they used to be on, take it out. Any desire for the alcohol, take it out in the name of Jesus. God, they need to be free. Their body is the temple. God wants to have a mind that they can think through and a mouth that they can talk through and a heart that they can believe through. In the name, in the name, in the name, in the name, in the name of Christ. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of the Son of God, be delivered. Be delivered! God, I feel somebody's, somebody's really getting delivered by the Lord. Your faith has touched the Lord right now. Your simple childlike faith has touched heaven. I'm telling you the truth. Woo! Somebody's getting the help they need. It's coming. You can feel it. Yes, you can. You can. <laughs> Go ahead and weep. Go ahead and cry. Go ahead and open up your mouth. Pour out your heart. Jesus, Jesus, in the name, in the name, free, 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 people are getting free, oh, somebody at home, you're going to get free. If you're at home right now, just put your hand where your head is. Some of you are depressed. Some of you are lonely. Some of you feel stuck. Some of you feel isolated. But put your hand on your head and say, The Lord is with me. The Lord is with me. The Lord is with me. Oh, God, in Jesus' name. Oh. God, the anointing of the Lord is in the house. The anointing of the Lord is in the house. Hallelujah. Listen, you, you pray in these altars as long as you like. Even when pastor comes, you don't have to just stop praying. Some of you, the greatest breakthrough is coming. It's still coming. So if you're over here and you want to pray in the altar and you want to... Just keep praying, keep, even though we changed the service a little. Keep praying. Tomorrow night is going to be off the chain. I'm telling you, you better bring one person with you. Bring somebody with you. Hallelujah! Glory, 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 glory.